record and why we're going to focus where we're focusing and then um, really to continue into the future with us um, to continue to partner with us and really help make the impact um, that GS is making in our broader social and environmental justice movements. So that is where we're headed. Um, thanks for joining us. And because, as you all know, part of what we do is practice, I'm going to actually hand it over to Lisa so we can do a short centering practice together. Lisa, over to you. Awesome. Just locating that unmute button. It comes in handy. Um, good morning, everybody. It's really sweet to see your faces, the ones that are facing. Um, and nice to read the names and guess the numbers on the phone <laughs> icons. Um, my name is Lisa Thomas Adeyemo. Um, I am hashtag Team Resilience. Um, joining that team. And I'm also um, on GS staff part-time as the uh, program coordinator um, for the Somatics and Trauma um, and also widely other programs. Um, and in relationship to GS, I'm also a lead teacher um, of the methodology and have been in and practicing with GS for a little bit over a decade now. Um, so we are going to begin by doing a little centering practice and I want to apologize uh, true to fate and timing the garbage people are here picking up right outside the house in this moment so please um, forgive the external noise coming from this direction but let's just take a moment and um, drop in and really find yourself uh, below your thinking self so whether you're sitting in a chair, whether you're standing up, um, go ahead and let yourself locate um, sensation in the body. And that might be feeling for temperature, movement, sensations. <clears throat> the invitation here is to drop below the thinking self. Good, and just letting yourself feel how you're arriving on this call this morning, both in your body, what's there for you emotionally, and kind of whatever thoughts or narratives that are happening for you at 8.07 a.m. West Coast time. Good. And then um, let's take a collective breath together and really find ourselves about two or three inches below the belly. And if it helps, you can put a hand there. And sometimes I just like to jiggle my stomach a little bit to help me find sensation and connection there. And from center, we're going to begin by um, centering in our first of four dimensions, which is length. So letting yourself drop and settle along your vertical line. Having a little bit more space in the jaw for length. More room between your ears and your shoulders in length. Good, and in length, we're centering in our individual and collective dignity. So really finding, accessing that for yourself along your vertical line. Good, <clears throat> and from center, let's move out to our edges and width. Feeling for yourself left to right, striking a balance between left and right. And from center, really inviting yourself to come out to the edges. So that might feel like a, something can widen and relax out across the chest or across the belly. Inviting for more width between your cheeks or in your throat. Maybe feeling for the width of your bottom on your seating cushion or chair or the width of your feet on the floor. Centering in our relational space. 
And in with, we get to acknowledge um, the truth of our interdependence. And as I look at the names and faces on this call, I get to feel for um, the width and breadth of um, who we touch and uh, you all's contributions that support us continuing to be wide. Good. And then from there, let's center in our depth front to back. So right here, maybe something else can settle back and you can rest back into your sacrum or back into your heels, feeling for sensations at your back. And I'm sure each and every one of us can connect um, metaphorically at our backs to what's come before us, um, our own history, herstories, sets of competence and really what's at our back that informs um, this collective vision of the work that we're forwarding together. We can all feel for those stories at our back that inform why the work of generative somatics um, is meaningful for you. And then getting present with the front side of the body letting there be a little bit more present, open connectedness in the front of the face, front of the chest, front sides of the thighs. And while we have at our back what's um, already happened, we have out in front of us um, what's to come and we can feel um, our collective work generating towards a shared future. Good, and also extending our energy and presence out into this hour together. And then right here, I'm gonna invite each and every one of us to go ahead and speak your commitment to yourself. And if you don't have a commitment, um, the invitation here is to let yourself settle on um, what you deeply care about, what matters to you. And let that come to heart, to gut, to mind, and, and let that organize you. Your commitment, what matters to you, really let that live inside your length and inform your dignity. Let it help you take up space in your width and really feel that commitment and what you care about included in your depth. Good, and then right here, just notice what your mood is. And um, we're gonna do a very brief um, practice here, um, just a practice of extending gratitude. Um, so wherever you're seated or standing, you can go ahead and just let your arms extend down. And let's offer gratitude um, to the earth, the original resource. The original resource, grasses, water, trees, dirt, composting earthworms, the food that we got to eat this morning, every morning, all sourced from the planet and just really letting yourself extend gratitude down uh, for this miraculous earth that we all get to share. <clears throat> and then let's take that extension up, extending towards the sky. Um, I don't know where you are, but in the Bay, we have a nice foggy, cloudy overlay that just feels like a sweet blanket and extending gratitude um, upwards, stars, sunlight, galaxies, inspiration, really feeling for yourself um, what's one thing you're grateful to the sky for. Might've been that stellar full moon that we just had a few days past. 
Good, and let's let that go and extend out towards people, towards this circle, team resilience, team alliance, extending gratitude um, to uh, the truth of our interdependence, how we impact, support each other, and here we get to even extend gratitude um, to our more challenging practice partners that provide us the capacity to um, cut our diamonds on, so to speak. And then let's take that extension and bring it into self, just letting yourself make contact somewhere on your body. And this is a moment where you get to take um, a minute and just speak uh, a virtue for yourself, something that you have gratitude to yourself for. Good, and just extending that gratitude in, inward, appreciating uh, your good work, the ways that you show up, the things you care about. And then we can let that go. And um, I declare us centered and I will pass it over to um, Stacy. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you all for practicing with us. Um, excellent, so we're gonna dive in. On the uh, RSVP, we sent you a link to uh, basically an overview, a summary of the strategic priorities. Um, if by any chance you don't have that in front of you, you can email Danielle at generativesomatics.org and she can send you the link. Um, but we wanna go ahead and look at the document. And um, uh, again, you're getting kind of a sneak preview of this um, before we make all this public in the fall. Um, and in many ways you can think of this, you know, in somatics we really um, orient toward creating declarations about the future. What future is it that we want to help create? And in many ways we can hold these strategic priorities as our declaration for the next three to five years. So if you have this summary in front of you, um, just want to dive in on the cover page, you'll see a list of all the people who really participated in co-creating this strategic plan and these priorities. And um, uh, I won't read everyone's name, but I want to send my appreciation to them. We actually gathered over four retreats and numerous conference calls um, over about a year and a half. And we actually finished the strategic priorities. Um, we had our final call the day after the election, uh, the presidential election, which was like a good moment to go, okay, here's what's happening in our world and in our country. And are we aligned with making the difference that we want to um, in this new set of in this new context. Um, if you move down to the second page, um, we call it a living document. And these are the key questions that we were looking to answer. And I'll just read a few of them for those of you who might not have the document in front of you. Uh, but we are looking at what parts of our social and environmental justice movement should we prioritize partnering with. And of course, that's because we only have so much capacity. Um, we would love to work with all issue areas at all times, um, but we don't have the capacity at this point to do that. So where do we wanna prioritize? Um, another bullet is what impact do we intend to produce in the leaders and the formations? And by that, we mean the organizations, the national alliances um, that we'll partner with. So really looking at what do we wanna leave them with after we partner? Hi, it looks like Stacy is frozen. Um, so with that, um, Spenta, can we two-step and can you kind of take it from her baton and move us forward from there? Is that, and Stacy, hopefully you'll get back to us. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Spencer Kandawala. I am um, 
uh, I am a co-founder of Generative Somatics and um, uh, now a lead teacher and senior program consultant to the organization. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And like Lisa and Stacy, I'm on Team Resilience. So I'm a monthly donor to the organization. Um, first, just thank you all for joining us for the call and being interested in this strategic plan. Um, I think where Stacy was probably starting to wrap up was just uh, this strategic plan was really, um, in some ways, G generative somatics spent its first five or plus years really um, able to kind of bring ourselves to movement work and expand that work there um, without a lot of uh, with a lot of focus and intention, but not a lot of um, kind of concrete sitting down with a group of people and making something happen. And so this was really a pivot after all these years to go, we're now going to really hone in inside of movement uh, with who we're talking about and who we're working with. Um, but I'm going to lay some of the political context for us in which we were writing this plan, um, which I'm sure all of you actually know because you're living inside of it. Uh, so part of it was, you know, we were writing, we were creating the plan really in the end of the Obama era. And um, we know that with this change of guard, many things have uh, increased and erupted and many things have stayed the same. Um, but I think what many of us also knew was that coming out of Obama, no matter who became president, um, we, we, our movements were going to face a backlash. It's like under Obama, while I don't think most of us assess him as some bastion of progressiveness, um, what was able to happen during those eight years was <clears throat> just a lot of um, inside of our movements, there was a certain expansion and growth that could happen. There was a certain risk taking that could happen and trying new formations and um, <clears throat> to contend with power. I think that's what we saw inside of movements like Occupy, inside of Black Lives Matter and the movement for black lives. It's like these were all experiments and they were taking on new, new formations and new ways of being to, um, both fight the state, contest for power, and create alternatives in their communities. Um, we saw the water protectors fighting the Dakota Access Pipeline and indigenous rights really get not just, um, uh, like that's not a new thing, right, for indigenous folks, uh, but we saw a huge wave across this country and across North America of really coming into some new kind of allyship around this fight and some real um, intersectional analysis around indigenous rights and land rights and climate justice. Um, and then we saw an increase, uh, like a heightened increase in the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement against Israeli apartheid and Palestinian solidarity and some new conversations happening there. So those are all amazing wins. Those are amazing expansions for a lot of our movements. Um, and then, like Stacy was saying, uh, as we started to complete the strategic plan, Trump was elected. And we, um, although we were right at the end of writing it, we really started to look and go, and now what pivots are needed? Even though we're close to the end of creating this thing, what else do we have to expect? And um, what we knew was that the racist, misogynist, xenophobic backlash was gonna be more intense than I think any of us had ever expected. And the need for community self-defense and rapid response um, is becoming huge inside of our movement work and it's competing with our long-term visions and strategies that we're trying to practice. So we're seeing the consolidation of a lot of right-wing power into the alt-right, into groups like Brexit, into austerity movements happening globally, right? This isn't just happening in the US and right-wing forces aren't just dominating inside of the US. Um, and then of course, Trump and all his cronies. Um, and so the, um, the threats that many of our communities have faced uh, have just become I guess we could say more entrenched, they've become more heightened, and um, the survival of 
Black people, of immigrants, of undocumented immigrants, of indigenous people, of Muslims and Arabs has now been maybe even more heightened or the continued repression is more heightened. Um, and then of course the destruction to our planet and the ignorance around that from this current regime and from most regimes. Um, so I think that really what we're doing is we're going, a lot has stayed the same. We're not gonna respond only in crisis and something is different and what does somatics have to offer to, um, what does somatics have to offer to this moment, to this moment where things are similar and where things are different. And I'm gonna, I think Stacy's back. So I'm yeah. gonna pass it to Stacy to talk about what is our desired impact given the political context. Hello folks. Well, I'm, this is why we all have teams. <laughs> Thank you, Spenta. And um, I'm just having technical difficulties over here. So I'm going to be on by phone for now until we work that out. Um, so the desired impact we're really looking to have is on page four. And um, we, as you all know, have been working for really these last, um, coming on a decade, with social and environmental justice leaders, um, with members of organizations, and with uh, coalitions and alliances. And we've done that through our embodied leadership work. Um, we've also done it through integrating the somatic and trauma work. Um, and what we got a chance to do during the strategic planning is really hone and articulate the impact we've been having and the impact we want to have given um, the moment that we're in and the time that we're in. So um, on page four, um, here's what we want to leave organizations, leaders, and alliances with. So one is really the capacity to have a strong vision and to make declarations or commitments. And that really helps us return to a positive vision and act from our values under pressure. Um, with a lot of the conditions that Spenta just talked about, it can be easy to just start reacting and reacting against. And what we know is to really build the future, right? To build the um, equity, the environmental sustainability that we're committed to. We have to be able to come back to a vision and values under pressure. So that's one thing that we're um, bringing inside of the discourse. Another really is sustained connection. So the ca capacity to form sustained, trusting, authentic relationships that compel others. Um, and this is, of course, with the folks that we work with, as well as the folks that we're inviting in or compelling into a broader and broader um, uh, progressive movement to help build the society and the economy that we want. Um, coordination. Um, this is really important. Any of us who work inside of organizations know that how we coordinate with each other and doing that well is how we get really amazing things done. Um, those of you who studied somatics are familiar with the rhythm of action or making requests, making promises, um, being able to build aligned uh, vision and measure together. Those, those are all the pieces that we're bringing to the space as well. Uh, collective action really that capacity to take powerful, life-affirming actions with others, rooted in shared vision and values. So that piece is just so important. Um, you know, things move fast, as we all know, and we're up against a lot of different challenges. Um, you know, in some ways, I tend to think that those of us who are really about creating social change, um, based on equity, based on environmental sustainability, have the biggest job. Because we have to you know, create a vision that's beyond, compel a bunch of people together, and then act in alignment together. Um, the next one is really conflict as generative. Um, and this is important because we're gonna have breakdowns, we're gonna have conflict, we're gonna have differences. And instead of letting those differences split us, what we're really looking at is that conflict can be generative. It can help us learn together, it can help us actually build more trust together. And when we can come to conflict in a way that is uh, centered, where we can tolerate our own discomfort, or we're, where we're willing to open and change with each other, much, much stronger relationships get built. So those are these key pieces that we're really bringing through our courses, um, through our movement partnerships, 
um, through our work with alliances that we can actually um, work together like that fundamentally. Um, and then what, we'll look, what we're looking at is then where we leave folks is we leave campaigns and actions more life-affirming, more powerful, and more visionary. Um, if you go down to the next page, our organizational and movement culture will shift towards a greater mutual belonging, greater dignity, greater power, right? With an increased ability to heal, to transform, internalize oppression, and to heal trauma. All those pieces are really central, given that many, many of the people and the leaders inside of social and environmental justice movements are folks who've also been impacted by those systems of harm or oppression. So healing that impact while we're also leading is really key, and we found that in partner after partner. Um, that our movements will organically contribute to the development of alternatives, right? And this is, again, that when broader systems don't work, we also need to build the alternative systems that do, that are based on the vision and values that we're forwarding. So helping to support the development of transformative justice, um, community-based accountability processes, yeah, many alternatives that way. And then lastly, our movements will become more effective and grow to scale. Um, and I, I want to just tell a brief story. We were with the National Domestic Workers Alliance this week at their um, staff retreat. And uh, we've worked with them over these last seven years. We worked with them when they were two staff and then 10 staff and another 60 staff. And one of the major things we were working with them um, on that day is how do they tolerate the level of change that's happening inside of growth? So how do they pivot, stay centered, stay focused on vision? And then also come to scale. It's very fast to go from two staff to 60 staff. Um, in that period of time, and that's jarring for any of us, <clears throat> but to really have the impact um, that the National Domestic Workers Alliance is looking to have, they're focusing on building a quarter of a million members, and all the staff as well as the membership need to be able to not only tolerate coming to scale, but also invite it, and that, again, from our uh, lingo, um, takes a different shape or takes a different body. Um, so that's a lot of what we spent our work with them on. So this is really impact, our vision, our positive vision about where we want to leave leaders, organizations, alliances um, after we or as we get to work with them. So I'm going to pause there and spend to hand it back over to you. And I do want to let folks know we're packing a lot into our hour and um, there'll be time for, for Q&A um, at the end here. So spend the back over to you. Awesome, thank you. Um, <clears throat> all right, so just a little bit more, but maybe one of probably the juiciest parts of the plan is our priorities for the next three years. And um, so what I wanna start with saying is that we are gonna, um, GS will continue prioritizing um, building the leadership of organizations and leaders who um, of organizations who are committed to base building or membership building. So really organizations who are working in communities with the most impacted people and are committed to the development of those people to become leaders and uh, have power. Um, and inside of that is really the folks who bear the brunt of racial capitalism. So poor and uh, working class people of color. Um, we'll continue to work with both organizations who um, work, primarily work to make demands on the state and contest for real power. And we'll work with organizations who prioritize building alternatives to the state or <clears throat> different structures and systems like Stacey was talking about outside of the state's purview. Um, and then we'll continue to prioritize base building organizations that have a feminist orientation. In some ways, it was one of the coolest things that came out of the strategic planning conversations was realizing 
um, those of us who came together in the early days of GS just came with that orientation. And then, you know, in some ways, as Somatics Works organically partnered with organizations who also came with that orientation and a real intersectional analysis around um, how capitalism, imperialism, all those things function. Um, so those are all the things that we'll continue to do. And then where we as a group have decided to hone is that we've come up with two strategic priority areas. And one is freedom from state repression, and the other is environmental and climate justice. And as we did movement mapping and landscaping, we really see these two areas as being able to reach a, a broad range of organizations, alliances, coalitions, and um, as putting some limits around the kind of work we're doing so that we can make bigger impact inside of certain movement arenas over three years. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about freedom from state repression. Um, <clears throat> you know, really what we mean is working to end the militarization and racist policing of our communities that is connected to war and imperialism. So war abroad, imperialism abroad, and then how that gets brought back home to um, black and brown communities. And we're talking about groups who are really working on contesting the surveillance state, ending mass incarceration, ending mass deportation, um, and trying to sustain our rights to freedom of um, freedom from political repression. So, et cetera, et cetera. And then those groups who are trying to create alternatives about how we function in a different state that doesn't operate around political repression and other kinds of repression. And, um, and that, that was, it's hard to say what state repression is in two seconds, but that's the kind of basic. And, um, and I wanna tell you a story because I think one thing that's really important to know is uh, while this becomes a strategic priority, this isn't necessarily new work for GS, um, that we have worked with many groups who actually, this is the crux of their organizing work. And one of those organizations is the Racial Justice Action Center in Atlanta, who probably all of you have heard or read about through our literature over these years. And if anyone from RJEC is on the call, I just really want to honor you because this has been such a amazing project for generative somatics um, because we've really started with the Racial Justice Action Center from its inception. So we grew transformative organizing together and we're five years in and there's tons of stories to tell because it's really ridiculously inspiring. But um, the story I'm going to tell is uh, so Racial Justice Action Center just briefly is sort of an umbrella organization for many different organizations and those organizations prioritize um, decriminal the decriminalization of formerly incarcerated people and trans and gender nonconforming um, primarily black people in Atlanta and the state of Georgia and um, they've had tons of wins over the years it is amazing and they are led by formerly incarcerated people and black Tra gen trans and gender nonconforming people. Um, and <clears throat> in 2015, this uh, young black woman, Alexa Christian, was um, murdered in the back of a police car while she was handcuffed. It was a totally horrific case. And um, uh, she was shot by the cops 10 times. And um, so Racial Justice Action Center uh, Alexa's mom, Felicia, came to RJAC to really look for support and for things to do because she had seen them uh, contest the state before, contest the police before. And um, it was a, it's a pretty devastating story. You should read about it. Um, and there's not a lot of wins here uh, materially. But what I want to tell you about is how, um, how, uh, Felicia Christian, Alexa's mom, uh, decided to confront the police chief at in IHOP one day because he does this like cop talk, right? It's like a like a friendly cop thing, um, so you can go listen to him. And she was preparing to confront him. And what Arjack did was um, before going in, they did a practice with 
Felicia, um, in ally practice, and probably a lot of you on this call have done that practice, but if you haven't, it's really somatically looking at how do we ally with one another so that we can really feel it on our own terms. How does Felicia feel it on her terms that she's being allied with as she goes and confronts this chief who's not doing anything about these cops who shot her kid? Um, the cops were not charged, just so you know. There's not a happy ending in that way. But where the happy ending is, is that Felicia really got to say, this is who I want at my side. This is who I want to have my back. This is who I want to go in in front of me. And when they went in to confront the cop, they went in formation. <laughs> they just used the formation they created and practiced. And um, she was able to really powerfully go in and face this person who was, you know, creating such horrific injustice for her family. Um, and on the other side of all of this loss, she also got to really feel not alone. She had to feel not alone in confronting so much power and, um, and in some ways got to, in a very powerless situation, got to feel really powerful. And on the other side of it, really got to stay connected with people who care about her and who cared a lot about her daughter and, um, and um, continued to organize with our Jack and stay connected. And so <clears throat> um, while we're gonna get to dive into more and more of this work going forward, it, I also, it's also rooted in a lot. Like we've been doing this and, um, and it's exciting to get to hone here. And I'm gonna pass it over to Stacey and Lisa to talk to us about why environmental and climate justice for us. Thanks, Penta. <clears throat> um, okay, this is the last piece we're going to highlight, and then we're going to really open it up for your all's questions and comments and all that, all that good stuff. Um, in some ways, um, I don't know if we need to talk about why climate justice and environmental justice, um, because I think we all know the situation that we're in. Um, it's real. It's real. Like, we really believe in a future for life on the planet. And um, <clears throat> want that to happen. And um, it, for any of you who've kind of studied um, what's happening with climate, what's happening with the economy, um, of course, we all know that our president just pulled out of the Paris Accords. Um, and even that, most people, most organizers and most scientists say the Paris Accords are actually not enough and not fast enough. <clears throat> um, but we very, very much want to get behind um, the... Uh, national coalitions, uh, international work that is looking at climate justice and environmental justice. And that is basically combining uh, uh, sustaining life on the planet and the planet's systems, water systems, air systems, right, whole, whole gig, uh, energy systems, along combining that, making it inseparable, inseparable from uh, social justice and social equity. Um, so inside of that, what we're looking at is really <clears throat> ending and mending environmental racism. So that's like a concentration of toxins in poor and black and brown communities, um, really transform the climate crisis. Like we need to shift some things and shift some things really in our generation so that we have a positive life affirming future on the planet. Um, and there's a framework um, that's been forwarded by the climate justice and environmental justice movements. Um, there's key leaders inside of this. That's a just transition. Um, and that is, again, looking at shifting from um, fossil fuels to sustainable energy, from uh, systems, economic systems that are exploitative to ones that are just and equitable, and from uh, deeply kind of... Um, decision-making processes globally that are really focused in the 1% to a much deeper democracy. Um, so those are the type of organizations and leaders that we are um, committed to supporting and putting, you know, we kind of think of somatics as booster power, transformative booster power, so we want to put it behind um, those folks. Um, Lisa, over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you touched on much that I was planning to talk about, so that's really great. Um, and I love your booster metaphor. I often think about our work as vitamins for the movement. So that's funny, I just said that the other day. Um, 
I think I just want to spend about two minutes here to really lift up the work specifically of movement generation, um, which is one of the uh, organizations that we are getting closer and closer to uh, partnering with um, to really move this vision forward um, of tying in with um, supporting climate and environmental justice work. Um, movement generation was where I first came in contact with this just transitions um, framework. And, you know, you said so much, Stacy, but I think uh, the only thing that I would add here as to why I'm just so excited um, to be working with movement generation and using um, this just transitions framework uh, for any of you on the call who've taken any of our courses or have been introduced to um, the methodology, we have um, a visual that we'll use called the sites of shaping and sites of change. And it really shows, um, I was looking to see if I had a picture that I could hold up, but I don't. Um, but it shows these concentric circles of where we've been shaped um, and also where we have the power to shape back. Um, and, you know, there's the intimate the individual, interpersonal, the intimate family networks, community is a ring further out, then you have institutions, and then social forces and his, uh, social norms and historical forces. And then the last ring out is spirit and landscape. And there's a way where I've often felt like, um, you know, the other sites of shaping get touched um, and unpacked so deeply in our work. And I felt that there's, um, that there's always been something a little less unpacked in that ring of spirit and landscape. And what I really appreciate about the Just Transitions framework is that it just completely and beautifully ties and connects us in with that outer ring um, of how we are shaped at the site of landscape and spirit and um, the vision for this just transition pivot is really moving from an extractive economy to a regenerative economy um, and it really does a beautiful job of tying in why there's interconnection and overlap with our labor practices with um, how we get the resources and materials uh, that we get and how we use them and the impact that that actually has on workers um, who are doing, it just unpacks that so beautifully. So I wish I had more time because this is becoming one of my more favorite things to talk about. Um, but we're really excited to really be putting our energy um, behind uh, this focus area um, and really feel that uh, it's, profoundly right um, inside of our current political climate right now. Awesome. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks, Stacy. So <clears throat> um, we want with just a couple minutes to go um, to open it up to you all and see if you have any questions. Um, we would love to hear from you. And I'm going to give you some instructions on how to ask a question. Uh, so to raise your hand, um, look at the bottom of your screen and click on the button that says participants, a window will appear and at the bottom of the window, click the button that says raise hand. Um, and then uh, uh, Danielle will just call on you. She's moderating for us. Um, if you prefer, you can also chat at the bottom of the screen to everyone. Uh, but I know some of us are not that technologically savvy to know how to click back and forth. So um, please, if you have questions, go ahead and raise your hand on the, how I just said. Great. Um, we have Rayona. Hi, Rayona. Hello, friends and neighbors. Hi, Rayona. Hello. <laughs> um, well, first of all, I just have tremendous gratitude for what you're doing and uh, feel like my investment is very well spent. I'm curious about how you're affiliated with or is there any affiliation or intend to affiliate with the Women's March and specifically the uh, protest that's coming up tomorrow and the next day? Should I take this, Benta? Sure. Yeah. So um, uh, do you remember, uh, so the Women's March created a joint platform. Um, do you remember that? 
at the yeah. first big women's march okay so that platform a number of the people who got together to create that platform are leaders who gs works with so i jim Poo was a part of that um y'all help me out on who else was a part of it um rinku sen right so a number of people who we, we work with or whose organizations we work with are a part of that platform we don't formally have a partnership with you know, kind of the main organizing body of the Women's March, but work with a number of organizations who are a part of it. Um, so that's where we're at. But anything, any idea you want to throw out there? Um, am I still muted? Okay. There you go. Um, I guess what I would say is the more generative somatics can be seen as the kind of ubiquitous platform for leadership development um, with the appreciation that there's a capacity issue. Um, I just want to see us constitutive of all these movements that require embodied leadership and resilience to do their work. Yes, let us grow. <laughs> Um, hi, everyone. I just want to let you know, someone said that star nine is probably raise your hand for folks on the phone. Um, so you can try that if you are on the phone, star nine. Um, and let's see if anyone does that. Maybe I'll unmute. I think I'm going to unmute everyone just for a second, just to see if anyone on the phone has a question. All right, all, you're all unmuted. If you have a question, just let us know. Or a comment. At the risk of being a piggy, mm. I'll make one more comment. Uh, I'm going to move from uh, whatever my donor status was to a monthly donor and increase my pledge based on today's call. Aww. You're awesome, Raina. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That feels like a great segue. <laughs> Thank you for that commitment. Um, Stacy, um, and we'll have a little bit of more time for questions and comments in a bit. So if folks are holding something, this is not your last chance. But Stacy, can you move us forward? I can. Um, yeah, Rayona, thank you so much for that. Um, you know, one thing I just want to be real about is where GS is at right now um, is that for every course we run, like this year we're running courses in New York and Detroit, in LA and in the Bay Area. <clears throat> and we have multiple movement partnerships like National Domestic Workers Alliance, um, Asian Pacific Environmental Network, um, Bold Black Organizing for Leadership and Dignity, RJAC that Spenta talked about, <clears throat> that what's happening right now is we, we have a lot of programming with a small staff and even with that, for 30 spots in a program, we get 90 applicants. And um, we really right now could meet the need if we were three times bigger than we are. So we are very committed to growing responsibly um, because we want to sustain over the long haul. <clears throat> and um, I think one thing that's really important about growing sustainably as um, a nonprofit organization is we have multiple revenue streams, right? So we have fee for service. So some people pay or some organizations pay to work with us. We have individual donors, which is you all, which is the most secure and sustainable um, revenue source is ongoing partnerships with individual donors. And then we have foundations. And right now our foundation income is just about 35% of our budget, which is a very um, sustainable way to be funded. Um, often if folks are 90 or 100 percent foundation funded and the foundation shift its, shifts, shifts its focus or decides five years was long enough to fund you, all of a sudden there's not sustainability. So I want you to know we're, we're growing responsibly. And with all of that, um, really where we're headed in our next phase is let's grow to meet the need. 
Um, so <clears throat> we'll have a focus on really course enrollment, uh, movement partnership selection that's really aligned with these two priority areas. Um, we have an amazing teacher development program. We have 55 people in teacher development now. It is, it's not our bottleneck. Um, really, our bottleneck is the size of organization and funding. Um, <clears throat> we're uh, uh, expanding the role of non-staff leadership bodies, um, which is an awesome way to grow capacity. Um, and we've done that through the strategy body that we brought together um, through uh, volunteers um, through launching a what's called our generative somatics um, practitioners network um, so those are some of the leadership bodies that aren't staff um, and um, there's a lot more if you look on its page six it really gives you a sense of what we're focusing on to grow into this next phase um, and uh, you know to do that we need resources. So I just appreciate Rayona for leading there. Um, any of the rest of you who have the capacity to either bring new folks in and build relationship with generative somatics so we keep expanding our base, or if you have capacity to increase your donation or make it monthly, it just makes a huge difference here. Um, Danielle, is there anything else you want to highlight? I just feel aware of getting more questions and if folks have them or call. Yeah. Great. Um, I'll just share one piece. So first of all, I just want to make sure that the biggest thing that we all um, uh, share on this call is just so much gratitude. So yeah, thank you, Rayona. And also just thank you, everyone. Um, your contributions, both your donations, but more so just all the ways that you all contribute, your practitioners on this call, um, so, many, so many other ways that you all contribute to this organization um, is really amazing. And what just as I'm Danielle and I'm the development director, didn't say that, hi. Um, and just to say like the real ways that donations have an impact is making our programs accessible and affordable to working class people of color um, and all the communities that we care the most about. It allows us to build this organization so we can grow to meet this huge call for our work um, and also implement this vision and plan we have. Um, and it really allows us to experiment and be creative. So really just thank you so much. Um, that's, that's really the main thing I want to say. Um, and then I just want to offer an invitation. Um, you know, the truth is we have so many supporters and we're like, if we just look at our programmatic plans for the next three years and the budget that goes along with it, we just absolutely need to grow, not, not just our money, but the numbers of people who are in it with us. Um, and so along those lines, we are holding a fundraising campaign in September that we want to invite you into. Um, and it's called Get Centered 30K in 30 Days. And it will take place for the 30 days of September. And really we're inviting all of you to make a fundraising page. Um, say, this is why this matters to me. This is why I put my energy, time, spirit, and money behind this. Please come with me. Um, and we're really inviting you all um, because you are actually leaders in our community in many different ways. And we know that if you're fundraising, other people will join to fundraise and a lot of more people will donate and a lot more people will then know about us and want to work with us and, and take our courses, etc. So again, um, the campaign's called 30K in 30 Days. We'll be sending out information so you can sign up. We hope that you will. Um, Every week of September, we'll send out resources like templates and opportunities to phone bank with us, but we will also send you a somatic practice every week of September um, that will really support you so that when you <clears throat> tag someone on Facebook or call someone to ask, that we're staying centered and we're staying connected to what we care about and we're asking in a really human way. So that's coming up. And one thing just to put on your calendars is um, when you sign up, we'll have a call on August 17th at 5 p.m. Pacific. And me and Nazba Tom, who you see um, their face here with us, will be leading a call to really prepare you, talk to how, to how to talk about the strategic priorities on your fundraising page, logistical support, really just get you ready to be involved. So thanks for considering that. Um, we are at the end of our call, and it's true that we wanted time for more voices. I'm wondering if there's one person who wants to kind of 
respond to any piece of this excitements that you have or last question. And I will just unmute us all so we could do that. Anyone have something you wanna share or ask? I know all of you, you're amazing, <laughs> brilliant people. I know you have stuff to say. <laughs> okay, well, that seems like someone who <laughs> is just, uh, not on mute now. So we're now going to pass it back to Lisa then to close us up. <laughs> Lisa, you there? I am. I was talking my head away on mute. <laughs> um, mostly, we just want to really um, say once again, thank you all uh, for being here with us, for being um, present um, and available and generous with the ways that you um, support this work. Um, thank you for bringing your hearts to it. Thank you for bringing your guts to it. Thank you for bringing your brilliant minds to it. Um, and thank you for uh, the resources that you um, offer uh, to help us move this vision collectively forward. So um, yeah, notice what your mood is um, as we complete this call and just take a second and really feel for that. And we look forward to, um, continuing to move the shared vision together with you all in the upcoming years. So thank you. Thank you all. Thanks everyone. Thank, thank you. you so much. Have great days. Thank Thanks for joining. <laughs>